Welcome to Celebrating Beethoven. I'm Jason Weinberger, Pauline Barrett, Artistic Director of Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony, and I cannot tell you how thrilling it is to be back up here on this stage performing music for you. Um, if, you've, uh, if you've followed our fortunes, or really the fortunes of any orchestra around the country, you know that very few of us have been performing music uh, since this pandemic began. But of course, we've been very hard at work here at Waterloo Cedar Falls Symphony to find ways to bring music to you, even though uh, we can't host audiences here at the Gallagher. And we've been able to uh, look back at some of our archive performances. We've talked with our musicians, and here we are finally performing together. And of course, doing Beethoven is just a thrill. This is music that I've known since I was a kid, and it, it just feels unbelievable to have this program here for us as we come back from some time off and we look forward to getting back to making more and more live music. So this is a very exciting experience for us, and we're so glad you've joined us to explore Beethoven, where he came from, uh, the music that influenced him, the music that he influenced, and also get a chance to hear us grappling with all the technical challenges of this music live right here on stage. So you've just heard the first movement of Beethoven's septet, and that is the sort of the centerpiece, the keynote of tonight's program. And in fact, we chose that piece in particular and not one of the big symphonies and not one of the big piano concertos uh, because we thought it would help 
us to demystify Beethoven a little bit. In particular, this work is very much in the tradition of the Austrian, the Viennese serenade. And as you'll see as we go through the program, these are pieces that had all kinds of interesting variety. And Beethoven's was no exception. But it wasn't really the first piece of its kind. In fact, one of Beethoven's predecessors, and he sort of overlapped a bit with him, was Mozart. Uh, Mozart, of course, coming to Vienna, um, you know, just sort of about half a generation before Beethoven. And he wrote a copious amount of serenade music uh, for ensembles like the one you're seeing tonight, for wind ensembles, for all kinds of other groups. And these serenades typically are different from symphonies, from sonatas, from string quartets, in that they tend to have a larger number of movements. Often there are things the composers do that are quite unusual, and they, they do often feature quite a bit of march-like music, dance-like music. Uh, in fact, we can surmise that the whole tradition of this serenade music comes from, in essence, party sounds, um, pieces that were written for entertainment and not as much for a concert hall setting. So even though we are back here tonight in Gallagher, we're going to ask you to reimagine this world of uh, Vienna and the, the uh, so-called first Viennese school of composers as they wrote this music, most likely for the entertainment of those around them. So, to this Mozart work, it's the Divertimento in D, uh, the crucial number is 251, and it's a piece that Mozart actually wrote right at the end of his time living in Salzburg in 1776. Uh, in fact, music like this was probably the basis for Mozart's only real full-time job, which was ultimately writing dance music for the Viennese court. So when you hear this piece, you can think of sort of the young aspiring Mozart about age 20, getting ready to come to Vienna, and he's writing some, some pretty hip dance music. And ultimately, this kind of stuff allows him to get, get some gainful employment when he moves to Vienna. It also really forms the bedrock, I think, of his uh, musical style in these formats. We're going to hear several really interesting pieces of music that are essentially inspired by movement. So starting with the first one, a fairly typical minuet and trio. And so you'll hear the minuet section followed by a, a kind of a, a slightly different quality in the trio, a little bit more of a rustic quality. And then this regal, more court-like dance music will return when the minuet repeats. Now the second minuet that Mozart wrote for this serenade is um, really unique. It's actually a hybrid of a minuet dance and a theme and variations. So the minuet, the first part, is actually a theme, and then we hear three successive variations with the theme played between each of them. It's a fascinating movement. And when I hear this music, I can almost picture an event at which you know, aristocrats in Salzburg or Vienna were socializing and, and the orchestra's playing off in one side of the room, uh, people moving around, maybe even people dancing. Um, we won't fault anyone for dancing at home to this music, uh, and I hope you'll see us dancing together as we perform it for you coming up here in just a moment. And then this really sort of unique set of pieces that we've taken from Mozart's Divertimento finishes with a march, and this march is something that really should have been written for full orchestra. Um, I was telling the, the musicians as we rehearsed this, um, imagine our friends in the trumpet section and the timpani section being here tonight because those are the instruments that you would typically hear in this music. But instead we have it set for this smaller divertimento ensemble. And so we've done our best to give it this, this wonderful march-like quality that you hear in some of Mozart's serenades. And, and you also hear quite a, a bit of this in Mozart's operas. It's a very graphic and a very pictorial way for him of, uh, of communicating the sort of regality through his music. Um, so this is music that uh, most likely, at least in kind, um, in its kind, it really influenced Beethoven, uh, coming from, as I said, a, a, about 25 years before Beethoven's Serenade, Mozart's Divertimento in D major.
All right, after all of that dance music, we'll give the players a few minutes to take a break while we talk about a composer who came after Beethoven, and that is Franz Schubert. Um, also lived in Vienna, um, again, kind of overlapping with Beethoven, um, uh, but not really quite in the same exact period of time. And so we hear such an interesting development as we move through these composers from Mozart to Beethoven to Schubert. And, and some of the other composers we'll talk about during this concert. Uh, but Schubert's really interesting in this particular context because he wrote one of the most singular works in this form, in this kind of divertimento serenade form that really began to develop into something different during this first part of the 19th century. And in fact, we see that word divertimento or serenade start to fall away, and we see these pieces instead starting to be defined by the number of players in them. So we have Beethoven's septet, and now we're going to come to Schubert's octet. So Schubert, in this case, is adding one additional player, and that is a string part. We have now a string quintet with two violins, viola, cello, and bass, as opposed to what we see in the Beethoven septet, which is just one violin. Um, and, and that becomes a little bit more of a standard pairing as you go further and further into the 19th century, but Schubert was among the first to do that. Same wind complement of clarinet and 
bassoon, and horn, the darker of the woodwind instruments, giving the sound a unique timbre in both of these pieces without the presence of the flute and the oboe. Schubert's piece comes 25 years after Beethoven's septet. So we were hoping on this program we could give you a feel for kind of the passage of musical style over the course of a generation or two. Mozart first, then about a quarter of a century till Beethoven, then another quarter of a century till we hear the Schubert octet. Now we could devote probably three concerts and conversations to the Schubert octet, so we're not going to go too deeply into it. But we selected one of the really amazing movements from this piece. It is the theme and variations movement, sort of picking up a little bit on some of the things that we saw in Mozart. And also, uh, we see a lot of theme and variation in Beethoven. We won't play you one of Beethoven's theme and variations today, but trust me that his work in that area really must have been a big influence on Schubert. Schubert kind of takes the idea and moves off in his own direction, starting with this wonderful, almost simple little country tune played by the violin. I love to, to think of this music as being much more rustic than it is formal. You know, these days we're used to hearing it in beautiful concert halls, but I'm not sure that would have been the experience of a you know, 18th or 19th century audience. And I think the illusions that Schubert is making when he writes the music in that style would have been immediately apparent to the audience. They would have heard right away, oh, Schubert's kind of, you know, pulling in that, that rustic vibe, or here's a little simple shepherd's tune. You know, those kinds of things would have been pretty recognizable to the audience. And so I think, uh, I think Schubert does that very much consciously in this piece, starting simply to give himself this wonderful palette from which to work. Um, of course, before we even leave the theme, we hear some beautiful instrumentation, which is so uh, characteristic of Schubert. In fact, I would say one of the huge differences from Beethoven, especially in his earlier period, into Schubert is this increasing mastery of these instruments playing together. Frequently in Beethoven's septet, we hear him kind of trying to figure out how the instruments fit. Sometimes it can actually be awkward for the players. Schubert starts to feel more like everything is exactly in the right place. And so I think you'll, you'll appreciate that as you hear these pieces together uh, to get a real sense for um, that progression in the musical style. And let's not shortchange Schubert. He was a marvelous composer who had a tremendous command of uh, the instruments in a chamber music setting. And in fact, this piece, the octet, comes from a period of time during which he wrote some of his other great chamber music, string quartets and, and some other pieces. Uh, and so I think, you know, we'll give Schubert credit while even recognizing that over this time there's quite a dynamic shift in the capabilities of the wind instruments and the way in which composers handle them. One thing to listen for in this, in this movement is the, just the incredible virtuosic playing of our musicians. Um, we're so fortunate to have uh, such great musicians here in Iowa and I have felt lucky since the moment I first walked on this stage almost 20 years ago uh, uh, to be a part of the unique atmosphere we have working together. This is a great example of just a wonderful collaborative piece. Might not normally even need a conductor. We've chosen to do that in this circumstance because of our distancing requirements that have been required by the pandemic and our need to do that indoors. And so for me to be able to participate with these virtuosi and just kind of join along as they play these wonderful solo expressions, that's been just so joyous for me. So, so listen to this wonderful solo playing. We're going to hear it in the, in the violin and the cello. You're going to hear it all through the woodwind instruments. And I would, I would urge you just to lean back and let it wash over you. It's, it's magnificent music here in this wonderful theme and variations from Schubert's 1824 octet.
I hope you enjoyed that journey through the theme and variations movement of Schubert's octet. Uh, it just makes me want to do the whole piece, but today's program has a different purpose, and that's to kind of take a wider view of the musical landscape around Beethoven in Vienna, and particularly this style of larger concerted chamber music that we see emerging during this period of time during the early 19th century. And in fact, another composer who uh, dipped his toe or whole foot or whole leg or maybe just dove in with this form is a composer named Spohr who all clarinetists know. So this guy's been torturing me personally since I was way back in high school. He wrote a, a ton of great and very difficult clarinet music. Uh, and he also wrote some wonderful and charming chamber music and orchestral music. Uh, we don't know his name quite as well these days, but he was a significant presence in Vienna uh, right around this time that we're studying during this concert. Um, he moved to Vienna around 1812, 1813, um, actually got to know Beethoven right away and got himself set up in the musical circles there and, and, and was an influential character. Um, the story with his large divertimento style piece is a little bit different. This one was prompted by a commission from a player who had previously worked with Haydn. And the reason I mention that is just because I find it so fascinating how many connections there were between these composers. We often tend to see them like we see Beethoven as a bust on a, a mantle, you know, and they're all separated from each other. But in reality, this period of time in Vienna was uh, an incredible sort of mixing, melting pot of musical ideas. And many composers who were coming to the city from other places and bringing different perspectives with them. I mean, that's true of Mozart. It's true of Beethoven. It's true of Spohr. A little less true of Schubert. But, but I think it's, it's a significant part of what's always made Vienna great is the ideas from outside that seem to synthesize there. And Spohr was very much a part of that. Coming in to write this nonet at the, uh, at the encouragement of this, of this Viennese musician who had played with Haydn. Um, so uh, Spohr sets about writing this piece for nine instruments. It's our largest work today. And um, I think it's the piece that's probably the least in the serenade mode, but one that is very demonstrative of what can be done with an ensemble of this type. And certainly by adding in the flute and the oboe, uh, we add the timbres that are sort of missing from all of the other music that we've heard so far on the program. Um, and that, that gives the piece a kind of a sparkle, a kind of virtuosity really, um, that I wanted to introduce uh, because I think it's a really important part of the musical style of the time. We're going to do the finale of, of Spohr's Nonet, and this is, um, this is something that I guess you could describe as sort of a, a kind of a mini violin concerto. There's quite a bit of violin featured in this performance, and it's such a joy to work with Anita because um, she's willing to, um, you know, just take on any challenge. And over the last couple of years, she's played Scheherazade, she's taken on some hideously difficult contemporary music solos. Uh, and in this program, she really is the feature musician. The violin was the leader of these groups. And in this case, it, it almost feels like a miniature concerto for violin, but with some wonderful work in the woodwinds. It reminds me a little bit of Mendelssohn. Um, but I think we also hear the influence of Beethoven and Spohr. Um, uh, he, he certainly uh, venerated Beethoven, um, even though he kind of went his own way. And I think the piece situates really beautifully in this setting. So we, we've worked to kind, of, to kind of make this piece just really feel vibrant and, uh, and bring all of that sparkle to the surface. And I hope you're tapping your toe at home along as much as we have been during our rehearsals. Up next, the Spohr Nonet.
Okay, just need to catch our breath after that romp through the finale of Spore's Nanette before we present our final piece in the program, which is the last movement of Beethoven's Septet. And before we get into that, I do want to uh, kind of pause and zoom out for a moment to acknowledge uh, so many of the people who have made it possible for us to even be here performing this program for you. And I'll start with the amazing staff right here at the Gallagher Blue Dorn. Um, they have had to make countless adjustments and be incredibly creative in order to be able to welcome student ensembles back onto the stage for all of their rehearsals, to be able to accommodate us for programs like this. The Gallagher is, of course, presenting its own series, indoors and outdoors. Um, and this staff has just, as always, done an incredible job. On top of all of that, they're also filming the concert that you're seeing today using the capabilities of the Gallagher Blue Dorn video system and uh, participating in the whole editing process. It's been amazing to collaborate with the staff here and I just want to thank each and every one of them for all the work they've done. Adding to that, we've also been very lucky to have Cedar Falls Channel 15 here with us for this performance, adding some extra camera work and you'll be able to watch this on Cedar Falls Channel 15 as well once it has its online premiere. So we're really grateful for uh, the CF folks for coming in as well, the whole production team doing such incredible work. And also, in general, throughout the last couple of months, I've been so impressed by what has gone on behind the scenes here at the symphony. The staff has done an absolutely amazing job. It seems like every single day something pops up that forces us to kind of change course and, and figure out how we're going to manage a particular situation. Um, we've changed the way we budget, we've changed the way we do our planning for our concerts, everything in order to be able to plan effectively to do things like this for you. And, you know, just as a performer on stage with my fellow musicians, I, I feel so grateful for the incredible work that the Stymphony staff has done behind the scenes. And while I'm on that subject, I mean, our board has also put in a ton of extra work during this time, meeting more regularly, learning more about, you know, all of the challenges we're facing, and being very, very supportive of all of the decision making that the staff has had to do during this time. So I want to make sure that all of you out there know how much work has been going on behind the scenes at the symphony. And again, uh, those of us who perform on stage feel incredibly lucky that we have that kind of support. And speaking of support, we are tremendously gratified at the support that has been shown to us during this period of time. Of course, we can't sell tickets, and we've really had to reduce our activity because of that, but we're not interested in, in kind of going off the airways for a while. So we came out this fall with a campaign called Ready to Play, and we've been asking all of our ticket buyers, you know, we're not going to have tickets for you to buy, but if you would maybe take those funds and, and donate to the, those to us over what you might otherwise be able to give, um, that is a game changer. I've had wonderful response so far, and I encourage you to participate in this campaign if you're able. We also have a number of individuals um, who you see listed in this program and you see on our website who have been our season sponsors and several special sponsors who allowed us to uh, move some funds around uh, and help support this very programming that you're seeing. Uh, and I'd like to acknowledge them, and that's the Waterloo Community Foundation. Uh, they thought I'd be thanking them this summer, uh, but I'm happy to thank them now for allowing us to continue to carry those funds forward. And Dave and Dee Vanavetter, longtime supporters of the symphony, who stepped up to, to really give a leadership gift to help us move into this digital arena and present all this wonderful digital content to you. A huge thank you to all of these people for making it possible to bring you this program this week. One last note before we return to the septet. We have a ton of amazing content online for you now and a whole week's worth of stuff connected to what we're talking about here. Um, you can catch Rich behind the scenes uh, showing you an insight into how we produce this. Um, we've got a wonderful conversation with several musicians who were involved in the preparation of this program. I put together a fun playlist that I narrate with Beethoven recordings, some going all the way back to when I was in middle school, probably, uh, and some other offerings. And if you haven't checked them out yet, please do so. I think you'll find them really rewarding. Uh, and I'm, I'm just really grateful that we can continue to produce these kinds of things for you uh, because ultimately our goal, um, whether now or when we, everybody's back in here with us, is to really bring you closer and inside the music that we're performing. And I think we're going to continue to do everything we can to make sure that 
you have an outlet for that. Um, and uh, very excited to continue our season uh, moving forward with some digital programming and we hope some in-person programming as well as soon as it's safe to do so. Now, returning back to Beethoven just briefly, we're going to finish up with the last movement of the septet. And this, this movement has such an incredible opening. It starts with the same chord as Beethoven uses at the very beginning of the piece. And then after a moment of silence, everything changes direction. The whole color of the scene changes. And we hear uh, a brief but very somber funeral march. And, and this is something where if you know Beethoven, you know he did this a couple times in his career. Uh, this march is, I think, kind of really one of the first examples of him using um, this musical trope uh, in, in a piece like this, in a, you know, a non-theatrical work. Uh, but then what's so interesting is as soon as we get to the presto, the fast section, it's like the clouds dissipate, the sun suddenly comes out. You know that feeling when all the light changes and your mood changes? The same exact thing happens in Beethoven. And, and, and it's sort of, um, at moments, it's kind of like a bubbling creek moving along. And then at other moments, it's like a, you know, a pack of deer you know, galloping through the woods. But, but there really is a, a feeling of naturalism in the music. And I hope in our performance as well. Um, it's been one of the things that's made it so wonderful to come back to Beethoven in particular during this time uh, and explore this aspect of his music. Because um, I think sometimes we lose sight with Beethoven of his humanity of kind of what a humble character he really is. Um, we see him often as that marble bust and he had such a huge influence over culture that he became almost a godlike figure in the 19th century. Um, I think it's wonderful to look at him through a different lens and see him um, as a little bit more human perhaps. I certainly hope that today's program has given you uh, some of that flavor, a little bit of the background of what he had in his ear when he wrote his music, a little bit more of who he influenced, and of course, finally, his inimitable style in his own music. Um, we are so grateful to be able to play this music and perform again together, and we hope you enjoy the end of celebrating Beethoven, the final movement of his septet. Thank you. 
Thanks for being here. Thank you.